So there's this thing that happens with really familiar stories in the Bible, like the one we're going to hear today, which is the loaves and fishes, is we sometimes kind of tune out because we're like, oh, yeah, 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 I know how this goes. And we start to watch it from the outside, like a movie that's happening in front of us. But sometimes I think it's useful if we can place ourselves in the story when we're listening to it and see what that opens up for us. Um, And since we want, we gave our children's blessing earlier, and we say every single week that we want our children to teach us about the realm of God as only they could do, I want us to try and put ourselves in the place of the kiddo in the story today, okay? For this little boy, can you imagine yourself in this massive crowd of 5,000 people? Everybody, everybody's taller than you. So being able to see is very limited. And most of them are pretty much ignoring you. You're not of importance to them. They might even be pushing you around. Your parents have brought you to hear another rabbi. So boring. But this one has everybody in the crowd listening. And apparently he's healed people, like really sick people. He also caused a lot of trouble in the temple recently, like with the money changers, and it was packed because it's almost Passover, so he's a little wild and unexpected. And some Samaritan woman thought he might be the Messiah, but who listens to Samaritans and women? Not my dad. So I wonder what he's going to do. He has this big crowd in front of him. What would it be like to wonder what he's going to do next? After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming towards him, Jesus said to Philip, "'Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat?' He said this to test them, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii would not be enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now, there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled 12 baskets. So this is one of the few stories that appears in all four Gospels, but each version is a little bit different. This is the only one with the little boy in it, or at least the only one where he gets mentioned explicitly, so it makes sense to pay attention to him. Now, in Matthew's version, the disciples say they have nothing for the crowd while literally holding loaves and fishes in their hands. And we learned two weeks ago about not saying we have nothing when we have something. God is not like that. In Mark's version, they say that they're in a deserted place, even though they have enough grass and land for 5,000 people to sit and rest and eat. Not nothing. Not shabby either. But in every version, they start with what I talked about earlier, with a scarcity mindset. And what that means is just the idea that you see what you don't have rather than what you do have. Apparently, Jesus' followers have been doing this from the very beginning. So we're in good company. The traditional way to have solved this problem is to buy bread, which is what Jesus suggests first. But Philip explains We don't have enough money to do that, Jesus. Do you know how much that would cost? So in this version, in John's version, what's unique and interesting is the disciples aren't resistant to feeding the hungry people or helping the hungry people. They just don't have the money to do it. 
the traditional way to feed people in this situation. And like I said, this has kind of been like us for the last couple of years. We want to feed people, both literally and figuratively, metaphorically, but we haven't had the money, right? And that's the way the church usually feeds people. We have money, we have it, or the money to buy it, and so we do. And it's very helpful, and it's important. I literally live across from a food pantry in Jeff. I see cars go in there every day, all day. It's needed. It's necessary. Jesus preaches about it in Matthew 25. I was hungry, and you fed me. Feeding people is a fundamental part of the Jesus story. There's a reason it's in every single gospel. But I also think Jesus is maybe making an additional point about how we feed each other in the story of the loaves and the fishes. So I'm going to be interested to see. We're going to head downstairs for our workshop. Meredith has worked very, very hard. (laughs) So make sure you say thank you to her at least once today, if not multiple times. Um, She's a little stressed out, but it's going to be great. You're going to be fine. You got it. Um, But I think when we go down, we can start with the overwhelm like the disciples felt. There are so many hungry people in the world (laughs) for all kinds of things. How can we possibly feed them? How can we feed them all or any of them if we don't have enough people or our building isn't fixed up or we don't have enough money? And then I started to think we also sometimes bring into that mindset like a critique or assumption like what if they don't want what we offer? What if they don't like it? Or the crowd will see that we don't have enough or it isn't cool enough or it isn't fancy enough. Though I will tell you Jesus and cool rarely go together. Like I said, we're good nerds for Jesus here. But when we name that and admit it and claim it, we have to deal with our own kind of shame or our guilt around what we think isn't enough. But what I love is Jesus does not let them stay in that mindset, just as Meredith will not let us stay in that mindset of not having enough. He simply asks in one of the versions, so what do you have? Go and see. He invites the disciples to name what they do have, which is what we're going to do in great detail, to start a list of what we have here and not make it more than what it is. We're not making things up. We're not living out of reality. But we are going to take time to celebrate what we do have in our own basket to start out with. Where we get real about the church that we are today but it's also a chance to look at what has been filling our basket over these last few years. Things that were there that we didn't even know that might surprise us, let alone what might happen to it when we share it. Now remember, we're imagining ourselves as this little boy. How shocked would you be when Jesus suggested that they get bread for the whole crowd? That sounds impossible, or at least super expensive, like Philip had said. But then suddenly the basket at your feet that your mother packed seems really relevant to this moment. And so you tug on Andrew's robe, but you have to do it several times because he's not even noticing that you're standing there surrounded by confused disciples and Jesus waiting for an answer. I wonder what would happen if you gave your lunch to this healer, to this possible Messiah? Is there something about putting it in his hands that could change this impossible situation? So the disciples do what Jesus says. They look around at what they see or what they have, and what they have is one kid with a basket. They have you. I remind you every week, there are lots of reasons to offer the children's blessing every week, but because I never want us to underestimate the gift that our children are to us in this community. Can I get an amen? They teach us about curiosity as well as any magi could do. They are our fastest route to hope. They encounter all without even trying. And I believe it is fundamentally in most kids' nature, like the boy in our story, 
they are so good at being generous. They are also kind enough to assume that we are also generous too. Like the boy in the story, our kids sometimes do this wild thing. They take Jesus literally. They think he means what he says. And they are often surprised when we as grown-ups don't do that. He told the disciples, no, you feed them. And instead of thinking of all the reasons they couldn't, this boy said, here, feed them with my dinner, with my lunch. It's why we read all the Gospels at different times, because they help make the story richer and fuller. Matthew and Mark are so clear that when we share our gifts on behalf of Jesus so that Jesus can use them, he will make miracles happen. They're so clear on that, even to something as ordinary as bread and fish. It's interesting, in their versions of the stories, we don't know where the fish and bread came from. They're just there. But in John's version, they belong to someone, to this little boy, not to the powerful, not to the prestigious, not to the rich, but to the small one who can't even see over the crowd, who's so easy to ignore. Jesus understood a different kind of miracle. When one person's hope and faith and belief that he actually means what he says, like that of the little boy, has the power to spark hope and generosity in others. I believe Jesus understood that generosity is in fact contagious in the best way something you do want to catch. Maybe some people in that crowd brought nothing to eat, but I have to believe others brought more than they needed, more than enough. That when those baskets passed and started to grow empty, did someone put olives in or more bread? Did somebody have some extra dried fruit or a little bit of honey? And once everyone shared... Everybody wanted to be a part of this act of feeding. They discovered not scarcity, but 12 baskets of abundance. And that number is not random. It's one for every tribe of Israel. And then it doesn't stop there because we know it's not just for the people of Israel. He goes into another crowd of 4,000 full of Gentiles because God feeds everybody. God's love is for everyone. God's kingdom is for everyone. God is the good shepherd. We shall not want. Our cup overflows. <laughs> That's why it was really important to me today that we have a potluck. One, I love potlucks. I was raised in the church. But there's always a chance to put ourselves into the loaves and fishes story I think some of people's favorite memories about churches are often when we've gathered to feed them because of an important celebration, whether we're celebrating the end of a life or a brand new life like a baby or a marriage or an anniversary or an ordination. I have never in 20 years of ministry and over 47 years of being raised in the church, I have never left a potluck hungry. Can I get an Amen. My earliest church memories are of my Nana and Miss Esther and Francis Wilhoyt and Verna Adams puttering around our very small fellowship hall and ancient kitchen at Edenside Christian Church, putting out cookies and pies, casseroles and green beans, and I was official taste tester of anything that needed, pecan pie, chocolate chip cookies. Back then, I always imagined I would grow up and become a church lady. And I sort of did. <laughs> Not the one my Nana imagined I would be, but I brought my salad today. Edenside, for as long as I was there, was a small church. 
but they could always manage to feed people. The years the budget was good, and the years the budget was not. Christians, and especially disciples of Christ, we know how to eat together. We're good at it. Even if you can't cook, everybody can pick up KFC. The loaves and fishes is a fundamental story of the good news. It's why it's in every gospel. We cannot escape it. It is one of the clearest images of the realm of God we are given. We share what we have so everyone can be fed, including us. And we know that so much more than about eating, right? Can I get some nods? I heard this interesting thing in a webinar this week. I heard a church consultant say, uh, members of clubs volunteer. He said, we're not that. We're disciples. Disciples serve. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right, I had that same reaction. I made a face on the Zoom call. <laughs> like, it's true. And that makes all the difference in the world. I know that I make this mistake. I ask people to volunteer for things, but if I'm truthful, if I'm theological, I'm asking people to serve. And not serve me, and not serve this church, but to serve Jesus. To serve the one who blesses, and breaks, and shares. Not to serve to keep the church running the same as always, but to serve the one who sees the hungry and says to us, you feed them. See what you have. Maybe you feed them through music and worship. Maybe you make them actual food. We have a lot downstairs. Maybe you feed their hunger for relationships or deep listening. Maybe you care and visit the sick. Maybe you pray or stand up and shout against injustice in the world. The story reminds us of our capacity to be the miracle that someone else needs. Maybe we are the very hope that they are hungry for if we're willing to serve Jesus. So back to that boy. How did you feel when Jesus took your bread and blessed it? What was it like to see all those people getting fed? What was it like when the baskets kept coming back full of bread that you had not put in there? As that child, you saw how one act of generosity, one that was blessed and celebrated by Jesus, became an act and faith of love for this entire community. You saw a crowd that had seemingly only been hungry become a miracle-making place where everybody got fed. And we know that that's not just a miracle that happened a long time ago in a faraway place, but is something that can keep happening here and now again and again. That the hope that was sparked then can be sparked here and now whenever groups of people discover just how blessed and gifted they already are. When communities just like ours work and act and serve in Faith, that there is grace and abundance present when we do this. I also wonder, what does that little boy want to do next? 